the subject is a blind spots that we all need to know when we are interpreting um, brain imaging, on, particularly on MRI and CT. So um, let's dive in. Okay. So um, so blind spot and errors. I um, mean, we routinely do M and M conferences and try to figure out which cases we miss uh, or where we make errors, and it's always a challenge because we have busy schedules. We have, we look at a lot of studies, and um, but 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 it's very important to have some sort of a systematic approach to try to avoid errors, to try to figure out where the misses occur. Um, so one of the most common areas is perceptual error. So what is a perceptual error? Perceptual error is when you simply don't see the abnormality. The radiologist simply misses it, uh, and it could be hidden in plain sight. It may not even be that difficult to see. Sometimes it is subtle. Uh, and it's interpreted as negative study. It's a false negative. Uh, and this is the most common error. It's up to 80% uh, of the error that radiologists make. This is to distinguish from cognitive or interpretive error, where we do see something is wrong. There is there is an abnormality, uh, but it's simply misinterpreted. It may be thought to be not significant, or interpreted as something completely different and a, a wrong clinical uh, treatment or evaluation is is obtained. So uh, this is kind of the false positive. You could actually call a negative case. Uh, you know, disease, that's 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 in that category of cognitive interpretive error. Uh, so this this is actually not as common as perceptual error, but also obviously worth um, focusing on. So uh, we are going to focus, however, on false negative. It's, it's just when we miss abnormalities. How do we, why do we miss abnormalities, especially if they are there on the images? So there are many, many reasons, and I think there's been increased awareness in general of all of the uh, perceptual uh, problems and how we kind of search through the image. We don't actually look at all the images. Uh, and there are also certain kind of psychological um, problems. So let's let's go through that. So in incorrect or incomplete clinical history, that's, that's a common problem. So oftentimes, if you briefly uh, look at the uh, provided history, it may be misleading or may not actually give you the information. A classic case, I actually just recently was approached by ANT surgeon and he asked me, how come you guys didn't report the product tumor uh, in a brain study that I ordered? And I'm aware there's it's there, but why, why didn't you guys mention it? And it was not in the history. In the history, I think it said something very big like dizziness and it was on the edge of a study. So the study was brain. So, um, and it was kind of hard to explain to the surgeon that, you know, because we didn't have the history, it was on the edge of a study. It was unfortunately missed by the radiologist. It's good that he already knew about it, so it didn't impact patient care. Um, but this is this is one of the problems we don't always get the proper history. The, the exam is not off and may not be focused on the area of it, uh, that that's clinically important. Uh, there's excessive uh, reliance on clinical presentation. There's also often uh, a satisfaction of report. So we kind of focus on the findings, especially if there's a comparison. Uh, so let's say there's a pituitary adenoma and we see, okay, the pituitary adenoma is smaller, it's bigger, it's been resected. In the meantime, there is there is like a totally different tumor on the edge uh, or, or vascular malformation that we are not paying attention to tunnel vision, uh, it, that's a very common problem. Again, we focus on the area of interest, such as you know brain, and we forget to look at the product gland, which is only on the edge of the view, and we are not paying attention to it. Satisfaction of search, this is extremely common where we notice, we make a finding, great, we kind of describe it in detail, but then there may be multiple other findings. So for instance, you know, we found one mass, but there are two or three more. So again, uh, especially with aneurysm, this is a common issue because you find an aneurysm, you're very happy, you find that aneurysm on a CTA, and uh, there is a tendency to just like kind of feel like you, you're done with a study, but you have to actually redouble your efforts because it's more likely they have more aneurysms. And then, uh, of course, we are also all dealing with high study volume, 
distraction. So like in our reading room, and I'm sure in yours as well, you get a lot of phone calls, a lot of uh, people coming in and procedures, management, all kinds of uh, clinical issues. Uh, and of course that uh, distractions are a big problem. So introducing some sort of ways to deal with that, such as an assistant uh, to deal with, with those distractions or manage them definitely helps as well. Check. Uh, so so what what are the solutions? <laughs> okay, we have we have problems. That's pretty clear. So how how can we address them? Well, uh, one one basic way to do this is checklist approach. So this is this is commonly uh, employed in, in many critical areas, such as you know airplane uh, pilots that will go through a checklist to make sure that nothing is forgotten. There are no major er errors in terms of how the airplane is operated. Uh, and I, I think because again, this is also uh, you know we are dealing with healthcare, which is a critical field. We uh, this is a good approach to take where we go through checklists. Okay, so even though it's a brain study. You know, our checklist will include looking at the orbits, looking at parotid glands, and we'll kind of go through the commonly missed areas where it's it's good to include in part of that checklist. Uh, and in general, I think just simple awareness, just simply being aware that there are blind spots that we have to pay attention to, and there are pitfalls in imaging. I think just awareness of that um, during interpretational studies that already makes it less likely we're going to miss things. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, it's also important to remember that there are artifacts and study limitations as well. So what are the common blind spots? What are the common uh, areas where we make these perceptual errors? Um, so probably the most common areas where uh, people meet, miss lesions are in the skull base or the clitus, uh, especially and in the general venous sinus, such as your cavernous sinuses. Uh, the second, uh, uh, the second category where people do miss quite a few are macular cave, nasopharynx adjacent structures and orbits. And finally, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the the third category, which is the the less common to be missed, is brainstem and cell sand fissures. So it kind of makes sense if you look at this list, like why are skull base and dural venous more frequently missed? Well, I mean, they're kind of complex areas. We often get artifacts. And it's also, we are particularly paying attention to the brain. So it's kind of natural that this may be uh, an area where we might miss. So we kind of have to focus on these areas more. And again, uh, in the head and neck and orbits, we might not be paying attention to them as much again because we're focused on brain pathology. So um, it's kind of important to look at those areas outside of brain. Um, so this is a, a more extensive list of blind spots now organized instead of frequency of misses um, by uh, by actual anatomy. So, so as I mentioned, you know it's much more common for us to miss um, uh, things outside of the brain because we are so focused on the brain since it's brain uh, CT or brain MRI we are looking at. Uh, so, uh, so we tend to miss osseous structures and dura uh, pathology uh, and. Um, you know, uh, even calvarium and, uh, and uh, dura, especially at the vertex, because it's kind of right at the edge of that study. And then, um, and then extra, extra cranial structures, orbits, and nasopharynx as well. Uh, and in terms of the brain, since we are focused on the brain, where, where are we prone to missing uh, abnormalities? So sulci and fissures, because again, it's kind of hard to see them. They're often, often artifacts. Brainstem and hypothalamus, because they're in part because they're so small, but very important to scrutinize. And occasionally we'll even miss things in supratentorial brain, um, especially if it's symmetric in bilateral parenchymal disease. Subtle abnormalities, such as gray matter abnormalities and epilepsy, uh, are easy to miss. And finally, arterial abnormalities in the circle of bullets. So, um, so we'll go through some examples of that. So um, hopefully, uh, it will help us to uh, avoid these type of errors. So let's start with sulci and fissures. So we're going to go through these kind of systematically. Um, so, <clears throat> so sulci and fissures. So this, these are all parts of leptomeninges and subarachnoid space. 
I find that disease in, in, in left engine subarachnoid space is, is often easiest to see in a superior vermis fisheries. Um, so if you look at those fissures, sometimes it may be hard to be sure if there is an abnormality elsewhere in other cell sites. But in the superior or, uh, vermis fissures, you often can see it even in early meningitis, early left meningeal carcinomatosis. Uh, cranial nerve involvement is another pitfall. Again, easy, easy to miss. Uh, so, for instance, I, I had a case about a year ago where um, there was really kind of indeterminate lesion in the brain. But then if you looked really, really carefully and it was really easy to miss, there was subtle enhancement of the uh, cranial nerves. And, and that was a hint that this is actually not a neoplasm, but, a, but a, an infection and, and eventually turned out to be, to be meningitis. In fact, it progressed and became kind of more obvious to be meningitis and a diagnosis was made. Um, but, but that can be very easily uh, missed unless we are specifically looking for it. And uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, lymphoma, meningitis, sarcoidosis, racemous narcosis, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and spiritual cirrhosis. So these are the common pathologies that are often missed. And um, so what are the pitfalls? So obviously, um, there, are, there are artifacts, especially on flare, when they're uh, with motion, high inspired oxygen is a problem, which can make uh, hyperintensity um, uh, on flare in the cell side. And, and then a variety of other things, including vascular congestion, uh, congestion can, can cause false um, appearance of normal appearance of subarachnoid spaces. So, and of course, the key sequences are flare, pre and post contrast, uh, and uh, post some some uh, some places they use flare post contrast, which is very very sensitive for uh, for this technology. And then, of course, gradient uh, sequences. So let's look at, a, at some cases. Oh, wow. Okay, so this case, um, so if you look carefully, uh, you, you, you know, um, you might notice something, but, <laughs> but if you look quickly, you might think it's normal. And, and that's kind of the problem with, the, with, with these kind of cases. This is very easy to overlook. It looks almost normal. But if you look carefully in the area I was talking about earlier, the superior vermis fissures, you notice that they are actually enhanced. Like this is a post-contrast T1 study. You can see that by looking at the paranasal sinuses. And these linear enhancement represents subtle, um, subtle left imageal enhancement, which could be meningitis. It could be left imageal carcinomatosis. Okay, so now we have um, a different case. And again, um, this is actually a relatively uh, a dramatic case. It, this, these cases can be a lot more subtle, but if you look at these T2 sequences, you'll you'll notice that the PIA is actually unusually dark compared to the rest of the brain. And you'll see it's almost as if somebody took a, a, a marker, a dark uh, marker, a black marker, and outlined the PIA along the the the, the uh, supracellar cistern, the pons, the, the various cell site. So this represents uh, superficial sclerosis so, or deposition. So this patient had recurrent uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages. I believe this patient actually had oligodendroglioma that was hemorrhagic, and they had recurrent subarachnoid hemorrhages, and uh, that that resulted in deposition of hemosiderin along the left meninges. But um, however, of course, it's very easy to just go through the study and, and miss this. Uh, and the gradient sequence, if if it's available, will will make this a lot more obvious. So having those gradient sequences can be uh, helpful, but um, again, we kind of have to uh, look for this specifically. Um, and here's another case of subarachnoid abnormality. This is this is rather subtle, and this is a CT CT images. And um, again, also very easy to just overlook it and call it normal study. Next case, because we look at so many CAD CTs. But if you look carefully, right here in the um, Supercell cistern in in the uh, going into the uh, uh, sylvian uh, uh, fissure, you can see there is very asymmetric kind of uh, it's almost cystic like expansion, and uh, you might notice there might be something calcified there. Um, and then if you look even more carefully, you might suspect there is something in the CP angle cistern. But again, very difficult because of the artifacts. So if you get MRI, on the other hand, it starts to become a bit more obvious that there are these complex multi-cystic uh, septations 
in the um, pipantine and CP angle cisterns. So, so this is obviously a, a leptomedial process. Also, there is a coronal suppression of CSF on flare. So this was racemous neurosicosis, uh, which can cause these multiple complex cystic uh, regions that can cause scarring and distortion uh, in the subarachnoid spaces. Typically, they will lack this colex, which, which you might see in some of the parenchymal lesions. And of course, epidermoids, arachnoids can look similar. Okay, so let's move on to the next area, uh, which is brainstem, hypothalamus, and pituitary stalk. Uh, so again, these are kind of small areas, and it's very easy because there's often just one or two slices to overlook uh, subtle abnormalities. So, um, so parenchymal abnormalities uh, will include medullary infarcts, lateral medullary infarcts, spontaneous infarcts. And again, the reason I think we often miss them is because they're often small and because um, there's often only like one image uh, with a very small infarct. So if, if one goes through it very fast and not specifically look, uh, looking for them, uh, they could be missed. And obviously clinically, they're often very, very significant because they could cause hemiparesis if they involve the cortical uh, spinal tracts, uh, such as medullary pyramid. Um, so, uh, so it's important to uh, specifically look for them. Uh, Non-territorial parenchymal include osmotic myelinolysis, infection, and syphilitis. Again, um, these, these uh, kind of vary depending on pathology, but we have to specifically spend a lot of time looking at the brainstem, even though it's very small, um, it's very important to scrutinize. Leptomeninges, pituitary stock, and epithalamus, like also uh, quite small areas, easy to overlook but very important to identify things that, such as uh, pituitary stalk thickening, enlargement of pituitary gland, um, leptomeningeal involvement in those areas because they can indicate uh, sarcoidosis, TB, lymphoma, histiocytosis, um, and can um, help us make an early uh, diagnosis of those um, diseases. So what are the pitfalls? So one of the big pitfalls, unfortunately, CT is very limited in this area due to beam hardening secondary to the uh, temporal bones. So uh, it's only on MRI that we see these areas well. Um, oftentimes there's also poor tissue contrast. And of course, key sequences include diffusion weighted, layer and T1 weighted post contrast. But um, so here's some, uh, some examples. So these are T2 weighted images through the brainstem. And, um, and we can see that there is a small lesion here, uh, and that involves inferior cerebellar peduncle and kind of extends towards the um, infer uh, olivary nucleus. And it extends a little bit further into the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Um, so, so again, we only have two, two images that, that show this lesion. So if we sprawl through it fast, we might not notice it. And then when we look at diffusion weighted images and flare images, again, we see this, this lesion again, uh, and it does show diffusion restriction. So, but again, because it's so small, it's just so easy to overlook because it's one slice on diffusion weighted. So what was this? This was of course lateral medullary infarct or Wallenberg infarct. So, um, but um, uh, unfortunately I've seen it uh, missed uh, multiple times just because, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's just only a few slices showing this. Uh, but if one looks for it, it's not gonna be missed. Okay, so here's another case, and this one is a bit uh, easier, I think, um, in that there is the lesion is much larger. This is T2 flare, T2 weighted, um, and it's kind of a central T2 hyperintense lesion. And you can see these areas that are not bright. Uh, these are cortex spinal tracts traversing this lesion. So this is a fairly classic uh, example of central pontine myelinolysis, but. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes, unless there is a good clinical correlation, and unless we are specifically thinking about this entity, it could be overlooked, and occasionally it could be just misinterpreted as just chronic ischemic changes. So here, perhaps clinical correlation and uh, good knowledge of history, exactly was it a metabolic disturbance, overcorrection of sodium, abnormalities, that would be very helpful. And notice uh, that once you realize, oh, this actually shows diffusion restriction, I think our concern for toxic metabolic disorders is gonna to be much higher. 
Okay, so um, a diffuse parenchymal disease. So this is another category of, of brain pathology that, that um, often is missed or misinterpreted. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of obvious why, because it's just diffuse. So it's, it might be symmetric, it might not be uh, so obvious unless we are specifically kind of looking for it. So, and this is very commonly seen in hypoxic ischemic injury, toxic metabolic disorders, and uh, Kurtzfeldt-Yakob disease, CJD. So uh, here's an example of um, a, a lateral, uh, so, so here again, we, when, we, when we look quickly at this, it might just look like, oh, okay, maybe normal, maybe just some artifacts or, or ischemic changes. Um, but when we look closely, it, it actually looks quite atypical. So, um, so we actually have these bilateral, uh, these are all flare images, by the way, and bilateral thalamic T2 hyperintensities and, and bilateral pontine, um, uh, central pontine, as well as kind of more peripheral pontine hyperintensities. And then when we actually look on diffusion weighted imaging, we notice, oh, this is not chronic. This actually demonstrates diffusion restriction. So this is these represent acute changes that uh, are cytotoxic edema. Um, so again, these thalamic areas do show diffusion restriction. You might even notice there's some splenial abnormality. And here, the midbrain is also showing diffusion restriction. Uh, so fairly extensive bilaterally symmetric process. Uh, so once you recognize it, then, then you will go through the differential and have to correlate it nicely with history, but the differential would include hypoxic ischemic, which was the case in, in this particular case, but would also include toxic metabolic disease. Um, the brain matter abnormalities and epilepsy. So this is another, another area, um, again, easy to miss. In, in epilepsy in general, epilepsy imaging, um, the abnormalities are often subtle, and especially if if, um, if one is not familiar with epilepsy imaging and it's not commonly uh, involved, especially in epilepsy conferences where we interact with neurology and neurosurgery, um, uh, they tend to be overlooked because the abnormalities are just so subtle. You have to be aware of the epilepsy. Oftentimes, you know, the type of epilepsy also kind of helps you focus on the abnormalities. The brain may be near normal, and the common abnormalities that we are looking for in epilepsy include focal cortical dysplasia, gray matter atopia, and then subtle generation of sulcation abnormalities. These are just some of the more common. Um, there, are, there are even more kind of unusual things like uh, encephalocele, for example, small encephalocele that can easily be missed. Um, but uh, here's an example uh, of a case. This patient did have epilepsy and obtain imaging for epilepsy. So normally, if you look at a case like this, you would you notice, of course, this T2 hyperintensity, but you would dismiss it as just white matter disease, right? I mean, we very commonly see white matter signal abnormalities, and just uh, they're not specific, we assume they are just white matter disease. But, but this patient was young, they didn't have any other lesions, and, um, and this also correlated nicely with, with uh, their symptoms, their, uh, semiology of their seizures, notice that uh, the T2 hyperintensity also is not just white matter. If you look closely, it actually extends to the cortex and then kind of tracks down to the ventricles. So this is actually a form of uh, focal cortical dysplasia. So uh, type 2 uh, B, I believe. So um, yeah, so this is just one of the abnormalities you want to look carefully for. Um, now, the next, the next area that we'll focus uh, on are intracranial arteries. So a variety of pathology can easily be missed uh, uh, in cranial arteries, especially if one is not scrutinizing them routinely. Uh, so these include occlusions of the vessels, um, uh, such as ICA, MCA occlusion, um, dissection, vessel dissections, aneurysms uh, are very easy to overlook especially near the skull base, um, cavernous segments and petrous segments. And then um, thrombosed aneurysms are particularly confusing because um, even if you have contrast, the, 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 the aneurysm might not you know, fill with contrast because it's thrombosed. Or if it does, you might fill only a small portion of it. In other words, 
tip of the iceberg. You'll see the filling of the contrast only in the, the small portion that's not thrombosis. It might be a giant aneurysm. So these are the various uh, kind of uh, blind spots that we tend to um, make mistakes uh, uh, about. Um, all right, so what are the pitfalls? So there are a few pitfalls also that kind of tend to mislead us. So, so number one, CT calcification. So sometimes there are hints on CT that there may be an aneurysm. Um, and these tend to be uh, aneurysmal calcifications for giant aneurysm, particularly tend to be curvilinear calcifications along the vessel wall or aneurysm. If the calcifications are dystrophic and they don't just occur in periphery, but are involved the entire lesion, then it's likely to be meningioma. But if you do see curvilinear um, calcifications along the vessel, along the periphery, so that could actually be an aneurysm. And I've seen um, people misinterpret something as a meningioma and kind of move on to another case. But uh, in fact, it's a giant aneurysm. So just important to keep in mind, beware of those curvilinear calcifications. Pulsation artifacts, really, really important to recognize them, especially I find them noticeable on to flare. So if you see a mask and it has pulsation artifact on T2 flare images, uh, then it's probably not a mass. It might be an aneurysm or, or a vascular malformation. Uh, so that, that can be really important. For example, I had a case where uh, they were already um, kind of getting ready to operate on. Um, it was uh, for a pituitary mass, and, and they were viewing these cases with me, and I noticed it had pulsation artifact. And, and I said, and I kind of analyzed all the images and I said, okay, this, this looks like an aneurysm. We need to get a CTA. And uh, we got a CTA and it confirmed this was actually a giant aneurysm. So very important. This is actually one of the big problems is uh, for pituitary surgery. We wanna identify those cases that are aneurysms because the surgeons uh, would need to plan uh, an open surgery instead of transferenoidal uh, resection uh, for a mass. So, uh, and then finally, uh, T1 artifacts. You have a variety of artifacts that could make it look like a vessel is dissected. Uh, this is known as slice entry, but on. So, so yeah, that's that's another pitfall. And uh, yeah, the, the um, MRA and vascular studies, of course, are really helpful whenever you, you raise a concern about something. So let's take a look at this case. So T2 weighted, T1 weighted. Uh, sequences. So it might look pretty normal if, if you look at it quickly. Um, but then if you look at it carefully, you might notice that uh, there is a flow void here, but there is no flow void here. So on the right side, you have flow voids. In the carotids on the left, you don't. Um, and and then, of course, it's, it's very useful to go ahead and look at um, your diffusion weighted image, and what do we see? We see an infarct. This is diffusion restriction on diffusion weighted image uh, in Centrum Semi Valley. Um, so this represents an infarct in the left uh, MCA because of a carotid occlusion. And when we obtained MRA, in fact, that's what it showed. In fact, complete carotid occlusion. So this is Petrus segment of the right ICA that shows flow, and the left is completely occluded, no flow. Uh, this is another image from the MRA, again, showing no flow in the left carotid artery. There is a bit of a collateralization by circovalus to the left MCA, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and that's why there is this infarct. So um, the next area to focus on is neural venous sinuses, cavernous sinus microscape. And as you might remember, this is one of the most common areas where we tend to miss things. Uh, so we do have to... Um, focus on this area in particular. Uh, what, what are the pathologies that we miss? Dural venous sinus thrombosis, AV fistulas, mastoiditis, osteomyelitis, and basophongal sinusitis, and telosa hunt. And, uh, you know, there are a variety of pitfalls, which is why it's so easy to miss uh, things. One of the pitfalls is just normal asymmetry in the cavernous sinus and uh, dural venous sinuses in general. Um, so we kind of have to correlate um, the vascular studies to CT anatomy. And what I, one of the things I find useful is looking for the uh, grooves in the skull base uh, to figure out if it's a hypoplastic sinus where you'd have a small groove or if it's a thrombosinus where the groove would be normally sized. Um, 
and then a variety of other things like arachnoid relations, high chromatocrit can confuse us as well. So um, let's take a look at this case. So a couple of CT images of the brain. It looks almost normal, right? Uh, but there, there is a very subtle abnormality. So if you look carefully, this, this actual superior sacral sinus looks hyperdense, and it actually looks a bit expansile compared to the other side. So if you compare the superior sagittal sinus to uh, transverse sinuses, you'll notice it's a bit denser. Um, you might even wonder if, if these sulci are a little hyper -intense, uh, hyper dense, and if there's some subarachnoid hemorrhage there. And then uh, we obtained a CT venogram. Uh, and on a CT venogram, you will notice that, okay, there is normal opacification of the transverse sinuses, but where is the opacification of superior sagittal sinus? So that's because it's occluded. And this is a follow-up CT of the head, and, and now the patient is developing uh, hemorrhagic infarcts secondary to this um, uh, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So again, I mean, the initial study can be very uh, subtle, um, but really important to catch it as early as possible to try to prevent these complications such as venous infarcts. Here's another case. This is a 44-year-old male with altered metal status. And this CT might look almost normal. You might just say, hey, you know, normal, next case. We just see so many CTs we get. Like uh, our, our hospital is so busy and we look at just a ton of CTs. A lot of them are normal. But then sometimes you get cases like this where it looks nearly normal. But if you look carefully, um, there is actually an isodense collection here, a subdural collection on the right. On the left, it looks just maybe that's arachnoid space or a small hygroma, but on the right, that's too dense and, and it's, it's actually a subdural collection. Okay, well, let's get MRI. So we've got a post contrast MRI here, and we do see that this, there is a subdural collection, but what's interesting here is that it's enhancing and along the periphery and maybe along the left meninges as well. And then you, if you look more carefully, uh, on these two images, you might notice there is actually a thrombus in the transverse sinus on the right, and here it's extending to the sigmoid sinus. And what else do we see? There is enhancement and opacification of right mastoids. So this is actually a case of mastoiditis with secondary thrombophlebitis and thrombosis of the sigmoid and sagittal sinus and secondary subdural empyema. And, and that's what we were seeing on CT here. So that's actually the subdural empyema. And as you continue reviewing your MRI, oops, I'm going to the wrong direction. Uh, my apologies. There we go. As you keep reviewing the MRI, um, you find that in addition to the thrombosis, subdural lymphoma, and mastoiditis, there's actually an abscess starting to form in the fusiform gyrus, and there is cerebritis in the temporal lobe surrounding the uh, abscess. So, uh, so this is really advanced mastoiditis with all of the complications related to it. Um, but again, unfortunately on CT, sometimes these are very, very subtle and very easy to overlook. So if we don't recommend MRI, um, this patient could be uh, uh, ignored or neglected too long and develop severe, severe complications, which could be treated um, if we identify this earlier. So, um, so, so the next area we're going to look at is skull base. Again, often overlooked. This is one of the most commonly overlooked clivus, cella, tersica, echoscape, and craniocervical junction. So what are the abnormalities we tend to miss in that area? So there is actually a variety of pathology uh, that, that occurs in this area. They're primary tumors of the skull base, uh, central skull base, and these include conosarcoma, chordoma, um, distant osseous metastasis and lymphoma uh, can occur here as well, and they can present with uh, corneal nerve 6 palsy. Uh, you can have uh, direct spread uh, of tumors, uh, particularly from the sphenoid sinus infections and from the head and neck tumors. And um, we also get a variety of pathology in various foramina, jugular foramen, foramina valley, rotunda. Um, the pathology that we find here could represent perineal spread from head and neck pathology, uh, glomus jugulari or uh, paragogliomas, and nerve sheath tumors, meningiomas. So these are all the pathologies for here. And again, very easy to miss. So pitfalls are one of the biggest problems uh, is, of course, cephalidity artifact. 
fat saturation failure because of heterogeneity. Sometimes the lesions are very poorly enhancing, making them particularly difficult to see. So they can be seen often sometimes just on T1 images or on CT because they're lytic. So, um, so we kind of have to really be careful in examining them uh, and looking for them specifically. So here is an example, again, very easy to, to look here and just say, oh, that looks fairly normal. Uh, the patient is moving, nothing obvious. But then if you look carefully at the clivus, it actually does have a uh, significant high point tense signal. And notice there, it looks very different from the rest of the clivus, uh, from the pituitary, uh, from, um, well, actually, that might be a pituitary gland. So, so it looks like the entire clivus is hypo uh, intense, right? Um, there may, that may actually be a part of the clivus or sinus disease. So, um, but anyways, T1 hypo intense. So you have to worry could this be a clivus lesion? And then you look carefully on this image, you might also notice that the carotid here shows nice flow void, but on the left side, the flow, flow void is not that great. So, um, and now that we, uh, the images we looked here, by the way, are T1 sagittal and T2 axial. So now this is T1 axial, and it becomes even more obvious that the carotid is occluded. Uh, and then looking more carefully, um, you notice that, oh, wow, nasopharyngeal mass. So this represents actually nasopharyngeal carcinoma that's invading into the prefectibral space, invading carotid, occluding it, and also invading the clivus. Um, so, um, so again, kind of fairly easy to overlook uh, if you're not looking for it. Um, but um, but if we specifically look at clivus and, and clivus, um, and, sometimes is is a really um, kind of like, if, if you notice there's something wrong with the clivus, then start looking further and further and finally realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of disease that's involving sinuses, that's involving head and neck mass, that's in, in extending intracranially. So it's um, I think it's one of the most important areas on sagittals to just always have an inner checklist and take a look at the bone marrow and the clivus. So nasopharyngeal carcinoma invading pre-vertebral space and the clivus. So, and um, now for the next area, uh, that's calvarium and dura mater, especially the vertex. So um, I think most of us are kind of aware that we should look carefully at calvarium and dura mater and, and have it on our checklist already. Nonetheless, especially at the vertex, uh, lesions do uh, get missed. Uh, a variety of things can, of course, occur here, and these could be metastasis, multiple myeloma. Um, in terms of dural abnormalities, so very commonly we see thickening due to intracranial hypotension. That could be the first uh, sign of intracranial hypotension, and then you look further and you might find additional signs. And then, um, and then a variety of other conditions such as virulomatous infections, such as TB, histiocytosis, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, these all tend to involve the dura and could involve the skull as well. So here's an example. So again, looking at it uh, quickly, you might just call it normal, but if you look at more carefully, you'll notice the dura is very diffusely enhancing and thickened. So these are post-contrast one weighted images. And uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons so easy to miss is because it's just such a diffuse symmetric process. All of the dura is uniformly thickened and enhancing and, and maybe it's a bit more dramatic at the uh, tentorial leaflets bilaterally. Um, so what was this? Um, this this was actually um, granulomatous uh, uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis. Uh, so this is a, a granulomatous bumper process and, and caused uh, extensive dural thickening. Oftentimes they'll have also sinus disease. So that's another thing you could look for. Next area that um, you want to focus on is the orbits. So um, in the orbits, uh, we might have diffuse orbital mats, which are, which may make it difficult to see. Um, I, one of the areas you might notice it more easily is on CT. It's actually kind of obvious when there is diffuse orbital mats, um, and uh, on T1 without contrast. Uh, you you know, I mean, I, uh, I've I've actually had a case of this. And uh, it was surprisingly um, easy to miss. Um, 
just because the orbits were so diffusely involved. Uh, lens dislocation, again, that's just a matter of, in trauma cases, we kind of just have to look, always have orbits on our checklist for brain imaging uh, and subretinal hemorrhages. These are, we are not going to, we are not likely to miss them as long as we look at them and have them in our checklist. So here's an example of a, a normal brain imaging study, um, but uh, this patient also had retinal, uh, subretinal hemorrhages. And again, I mean, as long as we look, I think it's fairly obvious on most sequences that uh, there is abnormality, um, but it has to be on our checklist. We also have to be not distracted by this arachnoid cyst. It just happens to be nearby. Um, and, uh, and of course, on these afferings, uh, parapharyngeal structures and parotid glands. So that's one of the important things to remember, the imaging the brain, but we still have to look uh, in head and neck. Oftentimes I find on coronal sequences, we include a lot of the neck structures far beyond the skull base. And, uh, and important pathology can be uh, caught. Um, particularly important, um, area to concentrate on is mastoid effusion. So we, we frequently see, of course, benign mastoid effusion is very common, especially when they're bilateral, uh, but especially when you see a unilateral mastoid effusion or uh, even in bilateral cases, uh, you want to scrutinize and make sure there is not a mass uh, or some other lesion obstructing the uh, eustachian tube, in particular nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So here is a case. So um, a CT, so we look on the CT and you notice there's uh, asymmetric um, opacification of the mastoid aerosol, so um, completely opacified on the left, but normally pneumatized on the right. Uh, so again, it could be a benign mastoid effusion. Uh, it could be mastoiditis in theory. Uh, this patient was not really symptomatic for mastoiditis. But then uh, if you look on the MRI, uh, Again, you notice the same thing, right? The left mastoid fusion, right, is relatively normal. Again, you might think, okay, that could still be benign mastoid fusion. We see a lot of these. Uh, and uh, finally, this is actually a nasopharyngeal carcinoma sitting, obstructing the eustachian tube. And you might remember, I showed you this case earlier. Um, this, this is the same case of that nasopharyngeal cancer it was invading the clivus. So one of the ways you could have detected it is by identifying clivus involvement. It's also involved in the carotid. So you could, if you notice the carotid involvement, that could kind of pique your interest and you start noticing it. And finally, this uh, this one was also involving the mastoid, uh, mastoid fusion. You don't always have all of these, obviously. Uh, in this case, you had all uh, very extensive involvement with all these other uh, findings. Um, but we kind of have to look at all of them. And I've definitely had cases where, you know, mastoid effusion was kind of the main hint that there's something wrong there. And then, and then when you look, you might have very subtle uh, nasopharyngeal, you know, fullness there uh, or mass. And then you recommend, you know, ENT consultation to look for a possible nasopharyngeal cancer and it turned out to be NPC. So, um, so we have to specifically look for this. So, um, so we we're kind of uh, reaching the end of the of the talk. Um, so, just wanted to summarize by going over um, the uh, the checklist. So, the whole goal of, of this talk is to kind of point out the important areas where we're and important pathologies where we tend to make misses, and to um, remember those areas and to kind of create a mental checklist. Uh, of what things we want to look for. So we want to make sure to get as, as good clinical history as possible, uh, uh, look at the prior imaging, but also not, not only be looking for the pathology that was previously identified. And then we want to specifically look, I, I put uh, these asterisks in the areas that are particularly important, sulci, cavernous sinus microscapes, dural sinuses, orbits and globes, and uh, even, um, you know, parenchymal symmetry. So um, that, that's also kind of useful and symmetry and density of brainstem. Uh, this is actually taken from a radiographics article uh, by uh, Bahrami uh, and colleagues. So I encourage you to, to look that up. I think they, they do a great job um, summarizing the blind spots in uh, brain imaging. And again, these are this is the entire checklist that we went through um, with the probably the most important ones to focus since they're more frequently missed as drug and sinuses 
and skull-based pathology. So uh, these are my references and um, thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to go back to any of the cases or, or slides and uh, answer any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Prof, for such an insightful presentation. So in the in the absence of a good clinical history and maybe the prior imaging, um, in your experience, what are some of the strategies that you employ to minimize some um, these incidences of missing some of these uh, uh, lesions? In the absence of prior history, you were saying? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and like, then, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, I would emphasize the importance of the checklist and kind of just keeping in mind the the kind of the psychological pitfalls because we all tend to uh, be efficient, right? Maybe we are very busy, <laughs> so so we we kind of try to take shortcuts. So we have like tunnel vision, we zero in on one abnormality, forget to look at other abnormalities, not have satisfaction of search. Um, and satisfaction of report where we just focus on previously abnormality and previously identified abnormalities. Um, and I think one ways to one of the big ways to deal with that is to just develop a, a good search pattern and a checklist. And whatever you encounter, especially going to MM conferences or on your based on your own experience, you encounter, oh, okay, I tend to miss uh, abnormalities in a certain area. To kind of, I mean, that that's kind of I try to always uh, kind of whatever I notice, I, uh, okay, I've missed that. I didn't realize, um, you know, there was this process. So I kind of try to modify my own checklist or my own uh, search pattern. And, and that tends to help, um, but we kind of have to be systematic as challenging as it is in a busy practice. All right, thank you. So we have a few questions from the residents with me here. Yes. So please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much. For thank you very much for the talk, Prof. Um, by way of trying to reduce the. Um, the incidence of missing these lesions that are in the blind spots. Uh, has there been any work in terms of like um, publications to kind of document the incidence of um, missed lesions specifically uh, so that we know which areas are, are missed, which lesions in which locations are missed more as in uh, any objective studies to that effect? Yeah, so um, let me show you the references. I think I summarized the literature there. Um, just one second, unfortunately, my PowerPoint is not copying here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's go to that last. Yeah, so yeah, so I found this this paper by Bahrami uh, and colleagues uh, in Ready Graphics in 2009 to be very useful. They kind of go systematically through the various areas um and and there are a variety of, of, of papers so uh, this this paper by bruno and colleagues much more recent also in rated graphics they talk about epidemiology of errors strategies for error reduction this is definitely a good paper uh and and there are a lot of I mean, in fact i think there's been quite a bit of interest as you can see here's another one um radiologic errors by berlin and colleagues um, and, and some of them go through, um, you know, specifically the frequency of errors and, uh, and kind of like the checklist. So that's, um, that, that's, that's where, um, you know, I'm trying to summarize uh, based on frequency. So the first slide I showed was based on frequency. Uh, let's see, where is this? This one. So these are based on frequency. So the most common. Um, areas where the pathology is missed is skull base and dural venous lesions, at least based on those papers. And then, and then like the, the second 
most frequent group is Meckel-Scave nasal pharynx orbits. And then finally, um, the, the, uh, the third, the, the less common area where we miss things is brain stem cell sign fissure. So that's, that's kind of based on the frequency. Of course, I think the frequency, of course, changes as we become more aware, and that's been my experience as well. Uh, so in training residents and fellows, so for instance, we see a lot of trauma, we see a lot of fractures. So uh, it used to be very common to miss fractures in occipital condyles. But I think there were several publications on this, and we tried to teach all our residents and fellows to look at occipital condyle fracture specifically. And now I think it's very low. It's very rare that people miss um, abnormalities there or fractures. So uh, I think once people become aware, the frequency of the errors does, does change, uh, and that's a good thing. I'm sorry, um, 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 did we lose a connection or? Hello, Prof. Thank you very much for that little um, presentation. I also wanted to ask, um, I realize some of the blind spots may be due to the technique or the quality of image. So in case um, one is encountered with that, are you and, um, are you eligible to any medical legal uh, consequences if you uh, you are unable to diagnose a pathology in one of these blind spots? Absolutely, and yeah. How so, are we to go about it if we encounter such incidents? Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. So that definitely, um, you know, there are medical legal consequences, of course, to making errors in, in healthcare in general and uh, in radiology in particular. Um, so this is, uh, you know, obviously we, we want to avoid errors because we want to help patients and we want to have high quality of healthcare. But uh, we also want to avoid uh, medical legal consequences as well. Uh, so I think, you know, by by focusing on these blind spots and then these common errors, we kind of <laughs> we kind of address both issues, um, but obviously uh, I think I think the, there is definitely fear of lawsuits and and getting um, you know um, punished by by either lawsuits or you know processes in the hospital, which can be a bit problematic because we need to discuss the errors and to talk about them to learn from them, right? So uh, so I think it's very useful, like in our institution. We have m and conference where we discuss the errors that we've noticed that, you know, people in our group have made or, uh, and uh, we kind of, we try not to be punitive, not to punish anyone, but to just say, okay, you know, this, these are the misses we've seen. These are the lessons we can learn. And that way we kind of all try to improve. Uh, so I think having those m, &M conferences is very useful. Um, but yeah, medical legal issues are definitely something um, that's good to be aware of, I think, but the best way to address it is to try to improve ourselves and to address, uh, to decrease the number of errors that we make and decrease the number of misses.